Hi everyone, I'm Audrey, and I'm excited to tell you how to take out the trash by maximizing transactional hit rate. This work is done in collaboration with folks at both UC Berkeley and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I know I'm the last talk before lunch, and we're talking about trash, but I promise this won't be a trash talk. So this project began with the observation that object hit rate, the metric used by most popular caching algorithms, is fundamentally flawed for transactions. Object hit rate is defined as the fraction of individual requests that can be served from cache. However, we find that most caching algorithms optimizing for this metric end up storing keys that don't actually improve transactional latency. To see this, we'll show results from the Tau Bench Product Group 2 workload. Tau Bench is an open source benchmark from Meta replicating its social graph requests, and we'll show results from two popular caching algorithms, LRU least recently used and LFU least frequently used. Over, over a range of different cache sizes, we'll show the percentage of unhelpful cache keys, or keys that do not provide any performance improvement. And we see that in some cases, up to over 95% of these keys aren't actually helping overall transaction latency. While this might be surprising, it indicates that object hit rate is the wrong metric for transactions and that there's significant room for improvement. So the focus of this talk is how do we actually optimize caching for transactions? First, we'll introduce a new metric, transactional hit rate, that precisely captures how much latency improves when caching for transactions. Then we'll introduce our novel system, Detox, that optimizes for transactional hit rate. And the idea behind our system is simple. We want to cache the groups of keys that are accessed together by transactions. And I'll go into detail for how we do this grouping. Finally, why do we actually care about transactional hit rate? Well, increases in this metric translate directly into significant performance improvements, both in terms of cache efficiency, which we define as the minimum amount of count space required to achieve a particular performance and represents cost savings, as well as improvements in throughput and latency. So to start, I'll give a brief overview of a transaction. Um, it's a set of operations that appear to take effect atomically uh, so we have an example here, we have a start, and then we have three operations here, reading A, reading B, and writing C. And these operations are independent, so they can execute in parallel. On the other hand, a transaction can also have dependencies. So here the write of A is dependent on the read to A, um, so it can't start until the read to A has completed. And finally, we have the transaction commit. The main challenge in caching for transactions is their all or nothing property. What this means is that transactions take as long as their longest path. So unless we cache all the transactions, that are, all the keys that are being accessed in parallel, then we won't see any latency improvement for the transaction. So let's say we have a transaction here that's reading A, B, and C. A and B are in the cache, represented in green, while C isn't. So the requests A and B complete relatively quickly. On the other hand, we have to wait for C to be pulled from disk so this takes much longer. And to the application, it appears as if none of these keys were in cache. Generalizing this principle, what we're observing here is this phenomenon we're calling cache contamination. What's happening here is that A and B are very popular keys. They generate a lot of object hits. So most caching algorithms will choose to retain them in cache. On the other hand, C is less popular. So it's more rarely found in cache. And we get into the scenario where A and B are always in the cache, but they're never actually helping overall transaction latency. Our key insight here is that cold keys can contaminate or affect the cacheability of hot objects. And this should be taken into consideration when figuring out what keys you should keep in your cache. So to give intuition behind what are the right caching decisions to make for caching transactions, I'll go through a simple example. So here we have a workload that's 100 transactions, and half of them are reading A. Of these, 25 are also reading B, and the other 25 are reading some other cold keys. For the other half of the workload, we have 50 transactions reading C, and in addition, 25 of these are reading D, and the other 25 are reading some other cold keys. So most current caching policies want to maximize object hit rate, so they'll choose to keep A and C in the cache, since these give the most object hits and we end up with an object hit rate of 50%. However, we actually don't see any latency improvement for any of the transactions here 
because we need to wait for B and D to be pulled from disk. On the other hand, if we cache A and B in the cache, our object hit rate goes down because B gives fewer object hits, so we only have object hit rate here of 37.5%. However, we now see a latency improvement of 25 on 25% of our workload. Um, and this example helps explain why we were seeing such poor results before on the Tabench workload with LRU and LFU, since these algorithms weren't taking cache contamination into account when they were making caching decisions. So to provide a framework for considering caching in the transactional context, I'll first introduce transaction length, which we define as the maximum length of non-cache sequential accesses. So as an example here, we have a transaction that's reading A, B, and C, and C isn't in the cache, so we have a transaction length of one. If C is in the cache, then our transaction length becomes zero. And for a more complex example with multiple layers of dependencies, here G is the only key that's not cached, so our transaction length is still one. With the notion of transaction length, we can now define transactional hit, which is a sequence of cache accesses that reduces transaction length. So as an example here, we also have a transaction reading A, B, and C, transaction length is one. If we are able to cache A, B, and C, then the transactional length becomes zero and we have a transactional hit. So to summarize so far, I've, we've motivated the need to move from object hit rate to transactional hit rate. And using this metric has several significant implications. First of all, optimality results for object hit rate no longer hold. So Belady is the offline optimal policy for uniformly sized objects, but it's no longer optimal for transactional hit rate, even if all objects are the same size in transactions. Furthermore, variable size caching is known to be NP-hard, um, and we proved that transactional caching is also NP-hard. This means that we need to use heuristics to be able to efficiently figure out what to keep in the cache at runtime. So the idea behind our approach to caching transactions is simple. We want to cache the groups of keys that are accessed together by transactions. Specifically, a group is a set of objects that result in a transactional hit when cached together. So as an example here, with this transaction, our first group consists of A, B, and C, since they are accessed in parallel, and the second group is just D by itself. While this seems pretty straightforward, there's actually significant challenges that arise when we try to do this grouping. I'll give the high-level overview next, and more details can be found in our paper. So the first problem we encounter is that there are potentially many groups to consider. Let's say we have a transaction here that first reads A, and then it has dependent reads B and C, and finally a read to D that's only dependent on the read to B. In this case, an, an alternative, alternative grouping would be to group C and D together and have B by itself. And this might be desirable if, D, if B is easier to cache. We find that even for simple topologies, there can be an exponential number of groups. And to address this issue, we make the observation that most of these groups actually give an equal number of transactional hits, and we capture this equivalence with the notion of interchangeable groups, which allows us to reduce the number of groups we have to consider from exponential to linear. Another problem we have is that finding these groups assumes we have access to the transaction dependency graphs, which are typically extracted via static analysis from the application code but this information might not always be available. To address this, we develop a new grouping technique called levels, which allows us to dynamically infer groups based on parallel request execution. So as an example here, if B and C are sent to the system in parallel, then we'll define them as a group. We compare levels with our other grouping techniques in our paper, as well as their overheads. So we're now ready to put this all together and take out the trash by introducing Detox, a transactionally aware caching system. The core component of Detox is its caching policy, which is an algorithm that scores objects and chooses which to retain in cache. So previous work around caching policies has focused on using individual object features, such as frequency, recency, and size to make caching decisions, and we use the corresponding group features. I'll give a high-level overview of how we do group scoring 
um, focusing on group frequency, and more details about how we compute the overall group score as well as the individual key scores can be found in our paper. So for group frequency, we solve for the minimum frequency. And the reason for this is because of the all or nothing property. Since we don't get any latency improvement unless all of those objects are in cache, we care about the minimum frequency the most. So for this transaction here, our first group consists of A, B, and C, and the group frequency is one since we're taking the minimum. Um, and we know that this is an example of cache contamination. Since C is harder to cache here, it lowers the scores of A and B. For the second group, it's just D by itself, so the group frequency is five. Next, I'll briefly describe our experimental setup before moving on to results. So all uh, application clients interface directly with Detox, which mediates access between the cache and the database. For our caching system, we support Redis, and we send all reads first to Redis, and all read misses, as well as writes to the database for which we support Postgres and TyKV. And we use two-phase locking to ensure serializability between the cache and the database. In terms of results, I'll first show ones for transactional hit rate, and we compare against a number of different baselines. One of them is ChronoCache. It's a state-of-the-art prefetching system that leverages transactional dependencies. GDSF is a popular caching algorithm that's known to give high performance. LFU is least frequently used. LIFE is an algorithm from the Pac-Man work that shares many ideas with us, including the all or nothing property, but focuses on parallel job processing rather than transactions. LRU is least recently used, and finally Detox. And I'll show results from the Taubench product group two workload, but we run other benchmarks, including Opinion, Small Bank, and TPCC in our paper. I'll focus on the 25% cache size, given the 80-20 rule in caching, where roughly 80% of the objects go to 20%, 80% of the requests go to 20% of the objects. So for transactional hit rate, the baselines get around a 50% hit rate, while detox gets a nearly 90% hit rate, showing a 76% increase, mainly because we're able to leverage this grouping information to make better caching decisions. So we note that the two more transactionally aware baselines here, ChronoCache and Life, actually don't do that well. So ChronoCache is only leveraging that information for prefetching, um, but it's Default eviction algorithm is LRU, and since the tau bench workloads are mostly flat, it isn't able to do any prefetching, so its results match that of LRU. And for life, uh, life does use levels to make caching decisions. However, it only uses size to rank these different levels and doesn't use frequency and recency, which happen to be the more important heuristics here for this workload. We also note that for all of the baselines, for them to achieve the same hit rate, they would need much more cache space, and we're 3.4x more efficient in terms of cache space, representing significant cost savings. And these wins in transaction hit rate translate into latency improvements. So in terms of average latency, we're able to decrease average latency from 4.5 milliseconds compared to baselines to three milliseconds, representing a 30% decrease, and by decreasing latency, we're also able to increase throughput on the system, and we see a 30% increase in throughput. So in summary, I've covered how we should optimize caching for transactions in this talk. First, by introducing a new metric, transactional hit rate, that allows us to precisely measure when latency is actually helping uh, caching for these types of requests. And then I've introduced our novel system, Detox, that allows us to cache based on the groups of keys that are optimized, groups of keys that are accessed together and allows us to optimize for transactional hit rate. And we've shown that by increasing transactional hit rate, we're able to see significant performance improvements on a range of different workloads. Thank you.